Hello everybody and welcome to the wine cast. It's back to a single varietal for this cast and since I'll be spending a fair amount of time on Italy over the next few months, I figured it should be an Italian varietal. So I went with one of my favorites, Barbera. By a very solid majority, most of the world's plantings of this grape are in Italy. And while it's planted throughout the country, in terms of sheer land under vine, it's the north of Italy that gets the lion's share of our grape, with most of the country's plantings found in the Piedmont, followed by Lombardia, Emilia-Romagna, and finally dipping southward, Campania. It's Italy's most planted red grape, though that's down from the number two spot that it occupied only a few decades ago, with Italian plantings of the grape having declined in recent years. Since Italy is such a major player when it comes to this grape, any declines in acreage there will be felt worldwide, and Barbera's current status, as of 2010 anyway, as the world's 36th most planted grape represents a dip from the 29th and 15th spots in 2000 and 1990 respectively. This drop in plantings is sometimes connected to a scandal that came to light in 1986 when some unscrupulous producers in the Piedmont were found to have doctored their Barbera with methanol, a dangerous and very toxic to humans alcohol, to add body and power to their wines. The tampering resulted in the deaths of more than 30 people, with significant neurological damage, including blindness to others, and in a loss of trust toward Barbera producers as a whole, even though only a small minority were involved in the tampering. The land under vine with Barbera outside of Italy remains limited. Non-Italian plantings are up a bit, with the U.S. and Argentina being home to most of those vines. But Barbera is planted in a large number of countries worldwide. Barbera is widely recognized as a quintessentially Piedmontese grape, with many sources claiming that its origins lie in the Monferrato area of that region that go, and that it goes back at least to the 13th century, where it's connected to a grape called Vitus Barbexis in documents found in the town of Casale Monferrato near the city of Turin. Barbera is very important to Piedmontese wine culture, but there are good reasons to be at least a little skeptical about these claims for its origins and about how long it's been in the area. First, as Ian Dagata has pointed out in his truly fantastic book on Italian wine grapes, what genetic evidence is out there doesn't show a close relationship between Barbera and other local grapes, suggesting that Barbera isn't native to the area. Dagata also thinks it's more likely that the Vitus Barbexis grape mentioned in Monferrato is another variety that today is better known as Grignolino. In fact, as Dagata notes, it's hard to find reliable documentation for Barbera in the Piedmont from before the 1700s, suggesting at least that its origins may lie elsewhere, though where that might be is still unclear. There are a number of grapes both in the Piedmont and outside of it that have the name Barbera attached to them in some form or another, including Barbera Davi, Barbera Chiaria, Barbera Sarda, and the white-skinned Barbera Bianca. But these are all distinct varieties and they're not closely related to our grape. So what are Barbera and the wines produced from it like? Well, Barbera is an intensely vigorous grape capable of producing very high yields per acre or hectare, and that, unlike, say, Pinot Noir, is easy to grow and generally resistant to drought and other vineyard hazards. All of these facts combined make it an important grape to bulk production in many of the areas where it's been planted, especially in the Central Valley of California, where it figures in many large-format, inexpensive wines. These qualities also contributed to its popularity as a grape after phylloxera had hit the Italian wine industry, and that industry needed a jump start from an easy-to-grow, high-yielding grape. Though the wines it produces can vary widely in style and expression, they all have a marked tendency to show a deep ruby pigmentation, high acid, and only a modest amount of tannin. This combination of deep color and low tannin has made Barbera a great blending partner for its mirror image grape, Nebbiolo, with its high tannin and light pigment. And before the regulations for both Barolo and Barbaresco were formalized to require 100% Nebbiolo, producers of those wines, and of other Nebbiolo-driven wines, usually blended in a little Barbera to give their wines a lift in the color department while not boosting already high levels of tannin too high. Cherry is a signature descriptor for these wines, along with raspberry and blackberry, but richer fruit notes like plum can also be there too, as well as savory notes like baking spices, both of which will come more or less to the fore depending on ripeness at harvest and oak treatment. Speaking of oak, 
though through most of its history it's been aged in large neutral barrels producing a very straightforward fruit-driven palate. Starting in the late 1970s, more and more producers began realizing that Barbera has a terrific affinity for oak, and as long as that oak treatment is kept in balance, it can produce very complex and interesting wines indeed. Hopefully all of this has got you excited to try some Barbera, so any thoughts on where to start? Well, Whatever its true origins turn out to be, the Piedmont is without a doubt Barbera's spiritual home, and there's where you should go first. Widely available and highly regarded are wines from Barbera d'Asti DOCG. These will be 90% Barbera at a minimum, though 100% examples abound. There are lots of producers working in this appellation, and the wines from it are made in a pretty wide variety of styles and sensory profiles, so a little research into producers to uncover each one's particular approach is key when buying Barbera d'Asti, unless you like surprises. Perhaps a little less highly regarded, but still very good, are wines from Barbera d'Alba DOC, where a minimum 85% of the wine in the bottle must be Barbera, and if there's a blending partner, it's often Nebbiolo but you will find quite a few 100% Barberas coming out of this appellation. For something very special and a little harder to find though, be on the lookout for wines from Nizza, an area that was once a very highly regarded sub-region of Barbera d'Asti, but has since been elevated to its own appellation and to become Italy's 74th DOCG, and where the wines must be made from 100% Barbera. Nizza is one of the warmer growing areas for Barbera in the Piedmont, and the wines from this region are known for their particularly ripe fruit character, with intense, nearly dried black cherry and plum being frequent descriptors. These three appellations are great places to start, but you'll be drinking quite a while before you exhaust all of your Italian options with this grape, and it turns up in wines from nearly every region, and it's very popular in wines from IGT regions as well, with, fun fact, 106 IGTs currently allowing for Barbera either as a single varietal or as a partner in blends. In the U.S., not only is Barbera not planted nearly as widely as it is in Italy, but much of the wine made from these plantings goes into bulk table wine. But there are a number of winemakers, particularly in California and Washington State, that are producing high-quality boutique bottlings. Oregon winemakers are renowned for their willingness to experiment, and several of them are doing good things with Barbera too. And given Barbera's fondness for warm climates, it's not a surprise that it's becoming more and more of a presence in wines from Texas and Arizona, so be on the lookout for those if you can find them. Speaking of warm areas, Australia has those aplenty, and several producers are working with the grape there to apparently good results, as are producers in South Africa, Argentina, Greece, Uruguay, and Israel among other places. These bottlings will likely be hard to come by, but if you see them or have a chance to order them, they may very well be worth the effort. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. Italy and its grapes will be a recurring theme for a while, but if you have an interest in other grapes, topics, or regions, keep the requests coming since I'll probably need a break from what I'm studying every now and again. If you enjoyed this cast and found it helpful, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and always feel free to leave a comment, question, or request. I'm your host, the Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.